About 10 years ago, I was in a church board meeting. It was time for me to give a brief report from my perspective on things that had happened since the last time the board had met. And one of the things I said was that I had just finished a sermon series in which we had explored one of the books of the Bible and that I was going to start a new series from another book of the Bible. One of the members of the board said to me, you know, there are other books than the Bible from which you could speak. I was taken back a bit by that statement. My response to the suggestion of using other books than the Bible for the basis of our weekly sermons was, I'm aware there are other books, but let's agree to do this. Once we have exhausted the Bible, we can move on to those other books. We're, st we're still continuing to work our way through the Bible 10 years later. We have not yet exhausted it. I have on occasion thought, why did this person want to move away from the Bible and pursue other books? And I think the reason for desiring other books to become the focus of our conversation of faith was that doing so would make for a more pleasurable experience. It'd be more pleasurable to deal with books other than the Bible because we can always find a book that agrees with our way of thinking. This is true because there's a vast number of people who are people pleasers. And a people pleaser is someone who needs to be well liked. And so there are people who will write books, including those about faith and heaven, hell, and God, and salvation, that are written specifically to please an audience. It's not important whether what they said is true. It only matters that the audience feels good after having read it. The Bible, on the other hand, was not written to please anyone other than God. The Bible is not particularly concerned with people's feelings. The Bible is concerned with the truth. And sometimes the Bible can not only feel hard, but the truth revealed by the Bible can be hard. In our modern era, some people want trigger warnings applied to the Bible to alert readers that what they might read may be considered offensive. A recent poll in the United Kingdom, for example, showed that nearly 25% of those living in the UK between the age of 18 and 34 believe that unless the Bible is edited, meaning words taken out, to remove the offensive language, then the Bible should be banned from public sale because the Bible contains hate speech. Our New Testament reading today from the book of Acts shows us that the idea of speaking from the Bible it can be considered hate speech is not a new phenomenon. We would find that Paul, having left the city of Philippi after having been unjustly beaten with iron rods for sharing the gospel, arrived in the Macedonian city of Thessalonica. And Luke wrote, Paul went to, into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, from the Old Testament Bible, if you will, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now, what do we make of that scene? First, Paul went to a synagogue. It's an important statement. Paul wanted to talk with the Jews who had already been open to understand the scriptures. 
that the scriptures were the one, were the inspired word of the one true God, and also present in the synagogue were God fearing Greeks, meaning people who were not Jews themselves, but nevertheless believed in the God of the Jews. Paul did not start sharing the message of salvation with those who disbelieved or who were opposed to God. Paul's message depended upon his audience having some prior knowledge, some belief in the teachings of the stories in that book. Second, Paul's approach depended upon reasoning with people. And this is a key point. Paul sought to reason with people. What does it mean to reason with somebody? To reason with somebody is to have a measured discussion and, and a conversation about the facts concerning a specific topic. And I think this latter point is key for us to understand why so many people today reject the Bible and any conversation about it. It's not that the people are completely ignorant about the Bible, because they are not. The issue lies in people no longer wanting to reason things through. If they even think they might read or they might hear something that will offend them, they'll want those trigger warnings posted so they don't read or don't hear it at all. If they later find something offensive or they're thinking the words are silly, then they reject what's been said rather than, rather than reason through it. Let me give you an illustration. The Ten Commandments are very much in the news. It came into the news because the state of Louisiana passed a law requiring the Ten Commandments to be displayed in the public schools of Louisiana. Now, many applaud this move, and probably just as many have angrily denounced this law. One social commentator's remark on the Ten Commandments, though, that it caught my attention. He believed that the Ten Commandments could not be from God. Could not be from God. Or if they did come from God, then God is very much out of touch with his own people. The commentator cited the commandment, Thou shall not murder. That's the sixth commandment. And he argued that such a commandment was not from God. Because the Hebrew people who received the Ten Commandments, did not need to be told that murder was bad. And murder was something that they should not do. They did not need for God to tell them not to murder. And if this commandment, the commentator said, came from God, then God was most silly. And because the Ten Commandments contain the statement, Thou shalt not murder, the commentator said we should then reject all of the Ten Commandments as coming from God and declare them all just plain silly. Now, some of what the commentator said is, is true. The Hebrew people probably did not need to be told that murder was bad. And to tell them that murder was bad was really not revealing much of anything new to them. I think that's probably a true statement. They probably understood that. But, ah, uh, there's always a but. But the Ten Commandments also said, Thou shalt not steal. That's number eight. Again, most of the Hebrew people probably knew stealing was bad, too. But how many Hebrew people understood that to a holy God, murder and stealing are equal offenses? They're equal. 
The Ten Commandments also says, Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, meaning to do otherwise. To not honor your parents is an offense equal to murder. And that same would be true for making false statements about one's neighbor equal to murder. Being envious of what your neighbors have equal to murder. And using the Lord's name in vain equal to murder. All of these offenses, the Ten Commandments reveal, are equally offensive to a holy God as is murder. When we take that in, suddenly, when we allow that scripture to speak and we reason with it, we're confronted with a very hard truth about sin. And how offensive sin is to a holy God. And yet we're also confronted about the amazing grace that a holy God is extending to us who have not murdered someone, but may be guilty of all of those seemingly lesser but equal offenses. But we can't come to such a realization if we simply reject God's word or uh, as offensive because we don't want it to say what it says. So perhaps we should put a trigger warning on the cover of the Bible that says, critical thinking required. This is why it's so difficult to have a conversation with someone who has a disdain for God's word. They are not able or willing to reason. And so we see Paul reasoned with the Jews. He reasoned with the God-fearing Gentiles in Thessalonica using the scriptures. It says he was explaining and proving through the scriptures, that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, Paul said. And some of the Jews were persuaded in this reason and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Thus the church at Thessalonica was born uh, but not without complications. Luke shared with us that some Jews who rejected Paul's message did so because they were jealous. And so these jealous people rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed them into a mob, and started a riot in the city. And they rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. See, the accusation against the evangelists composed by religious people or jealous people and given to the mob to chant had really nothing to do with the scriptures. Instead, the accusation was that the evangelists, Paul and Silas, said that people should defy Caesar because there was a new king, Jesus. We've discussed in, in prior weeks, this is a familiar pattern of response by unreasoning people. They stir people up with false information to cause them to make an allegation against a supposed enemy of theirs. And then when the chants begin, they stand back and, and, the, and declare and demand that the matter be investigated. This is what they did to Jesus. This is what they did to Stephen. This is what they have done to Paul on several occasions now. And it's still being done today. This time, though, Paul and Silas escaped the false charges of the unreasoning and jealous people. 
Paul would, though, later write back two letters to that newly formed church that he uh, he and Silas had, had established. And in the first letter, Paul says, you know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we made does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. Right? All accusations that people make against Christians. On the contrary, we speak as though as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God, who tests our heart. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God's our witness to that. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. And so there's two things that are important for us to, to see here as Paul is reminding the, the good people of the Church of Thessalonia uh, what, what occurred among them. The first is that we have it most clearly that Christians are to share God's word about salvation through Jesus Christ. But we're not to do it in a manner to, to please people. We should share the truth. But it's not for us to sugarcoat it or change it in any way. We should reason with those who are willing to listen, to share with them what God has already done. We are to let Scripture speak. The second point sounds a lot like the first. Christians are to share God's word about salvation through Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we get the idea that we are to share with others our own personal testimony in place of God's word. There's a, there's a time and there's a place for personal testimony about how God has changed our lives. But our testimony is not to replace the sharing of God's word. Paul didn't come in and say, let me tell you what happened in my life. No, Paul came in and said, let me tell you what God has done. That was first. So what would you say to someone? In sharing God's word. Perhaps you might say, well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's always a good place to start. And God created mankind in his own image, male and female. He created them. But the man and woman came to sin. That is, they disobeyed God. They sinned. And sin separates us from God. And to remove that separation between us and God, God sent his son, Jesus, into the world to teach us the way and the truth and the pathway of life with God. And to all who would receive Jesus, Jesus gives the right to become reunited with God as his children. Therefore, by God's grace, we are saved through faith in Jesus. Salvation, that removing the separation from God now and forever, it's a gift from God. It's not the result of your own work. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old way has passed away. And therefore, as new creatures saved by Christ, we then seek to live our lives as 
Jesus did. And all we need to do is ask Jesus to come in to our lives, to forgive that sin, and to teach us how to live the way, the truth, and the life. This is the message of salvation from the Bible. There are other ways of sharing the good news. But whatever we say must come from God's word. And then our lives, our testimony, should bear witness to what God has done when we believed, when we accepted Christ. And we need to know how to let Scripture speak. We see this distinction between sharing God's word and showing our personal testimony come out in Paul's letter. Again, his first letter to Thessalonica. Paul wrote, and we also thank God continually. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is, is indeed at work in you who believe. It's now changing you because you accept it. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone. The evangelist's plan is to let Scripture speak. That is to share the Word of God with those who do not know what God has already done for them. That's the first part. Then to acknowledge that the way those who have uh, accepted salvation through Christ have changed. That's the personal testimony. That's to be the second part. And so I want everyone to be encouraged to understand the power that we have at our fingertips in God's Word. Sharing it is not about pleasing people. It's not making it's not about making them feel good about themselves. We share it so people have the truth and can come to understand that God has provided them a way home to him. And that way home does not come from a philosophy of life. It doesn't come from a particular church or even a denomination. That way home comes through a belief in Jesus Christ and the grace that the resurrected Jesus offers. Let's share the word of God. Let it speak. Amen and amen.